All right, so there's subcortical structures that orient you towards novelty and prepare you for, for freezing or for attending. And the right hemisphere seems to be dominated by those systems. So imagine that what happens is that something threatens you, you orient towards it, the right hemisphere produces a bunch of images about what it might be. So imagine that's what happens when a child is afraid of the dark. The child's on the bed, they're afraid of the dark, they're crouched because they're frozen like a prey animal, and their right hemisphere is producing monsters to inhabit the, the darkness that are the child's hypotheses about what might be out there. Okay. Because that's what you want to know, right? You want to know what's out there. And then you want to know what to do about it. I can tell you two kids' dreams that are sort of relevant to that. So, when my daughter was about three, she came into uh, the bedroom that my wife and I had, and she was crying. She'd had a nightmare. And she said that she saw a stream, and there was garbage all over the stream. And she didn't like that. And so I sat her down, and I said, okay, so imagine the stream with the garbage in it. Now imagine that you're taking the garbage out and throwing it in a garbage bin. And so she, and I got her to like visualize that because that kind of puts her back in the semi-dream state. And then she cleaned up the mess and then she could go off to sleep. Now you, you could tell the child, don't worry about it, the dream isn't real. But that's not, that's true because it's not real like other daytime things are, but it's not like it's not real. It's a dream. Like a dream is real, it's just not the same kind of real. And so what I did with her was to indicate to her practically that if she saw something anomalous, something that was out of place, right, something that was a mess, that it was within her capacity to set it right. Okay, and so, okay, so now, your right hemisphere tells you what monsters might inhabit the, the darkness. Now, what you have to do is figure out, there's two things you have to figure out. One is what to do about a given monster, and the other is to do what about is to figure out what to do about the class of all possible monsters. Right. That's a whole different thing. That's something that only human beings are capable of, that level of abstraction. Right, and so what you might do about a particular monster is hide or go out and get rid of it. If it was just an actual animal, right? But that doesn't help because there's all the other potential predators that are still there. And so maybe you can go hunt all them down, but that doesn't help either because you, you can't hunt them all down. It's not, or it's not very likely, anyways. So instead, what you have to do is figure out how to configure yourself so that you're in the best possible position to fight off the monsters when they come. That's your best bet. All right, so now people are trying to figure this out forever. They're trying to figure out what's the answer to the problem of the class of all possible monsters. Part of that sacrifice. So there are routines, for example, in, in Hinduism, with the goddess Kali, you make offerings to Kali, who's this devouring goddess, and then she turns into her benevolent counterpart. And so sacrifice is actually one way that you can tame the monsters. If, if you think about the monster as the set of all negative future potentialities, you make the proper sacrifices, those monsters stay at bay. But then there's heroism as an alternative too, which, which means the active confrontation of the class of all possible monsters and the building of yourself up into the sort of courageous person that can do that. It took a tremendous amount of meditation to transform those images, say, of the monsters in, into, in, or to solve the problem of the class of those monsters. So, so now I'll tell you another child's dream. So, some of you have probably heard this before, but it's such a great dream that it's worth it's worth telling. So, I was at my sister-in-law's house once and her son was running around. He's about four. Very precocious, very verbal, very intelligent. Running around with a night hat on and a sword. So he's engaged in this pretty intense play world. And when he goes to sleep, he puts the night hat on his pillow and the sword by his pillow. And at the same time, he's having night terror, so he's waking up, and it had been for a number of weeks, Nate waking up screaming, and then, but he doesn't know why. There's some things that aren't going so well in the household, and the parents get divorced shortly afterwards. Okay, so that's, a, that's, that's what's going on underneath, right? And he's also going to go to kindergarten, and so he's about to go into the world. 
And so he's coping with this, you know. So I'm watching him zoom around as this night and thinking that's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, that night he woke up and, had a, and it was screaming. And so we were all at breakfast the next morning. And I said, did you dream anything? And he got really intense. And he said, yes, I had a dream. And I said, well, what was the dream? And he said, well, I was out on this field and all these like dwarfs came up to me. They were only about as high as my knees and they didn't have any arms. They had powerful legs and they were covered with like hairy feathers and grease and there was cross carved in the top of their head and they had beaks. And when, whenever he moved anywhere, they would jump at him with his with their beaks, and there were lots of them, and everyone like just said nothing at breakfast. It was like, because yeah. and he was right into this story, eh? And so we were all like, yeah, well, yeah, there, that accounts for all the screaming. And uh, so, and then he said, yeah. And then in the background there was a dragon, and every time the dragon puffed out smoke, it would turn into these dwarves. It's like, oh man, kid, you really got a problem there. You got, you got beat things that are biting you, and you can kill them, and that's fine. But then there's the dragon just puffing out new ones. So it's like a hydra problem, right? The old hydra is the serpent. You cut off one head, seven more grow. It's not a good thing. And it's such a cool dream because it, it really portrayed this class of all possible monsters problem. So you've got the specific monsters, and that's a problem. So you've got to get rid of them. But that's not the problem. The problem is, is that there's, a, there's something in the background that's just generating monsters like mad. And so I said to him, what do you think you could do about that? And that's a that's a loaded question, right? That's like leading the witness in a trial. You don't get to ask a question like that because it implies that it implies the answer. What could you do about that is not any different than saying you could do something about that. Right. So so I I hinted at that as a possibility. And his eyes lit up. Now you remember, he's already running around as a knight, eh? So he kind of already knew what to do because he had the whole sword and the hat and with that you know that you can go after the dragon. He kind of got that. And he said, I'd get my dad and then I'd jump up on top of the dragon and I'd poke out both of its eyes with my sword and then I'd go right down its throat to the firebox where the fire comes out and I'd carve out a piece of the firebox and then I'd use that as a shield. And I thought, yes! <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Man, it's so smart, eh? Because he got the thing instantly. He knew that, he knew, so imagine, first of all, he thought, okay, I have to go to the heart of the problem, right? And really to the heart, not to the dragon, but right down the damn thing's gullet, right to the place where the fire was actually being, was actually being created. Because there, it was there you could find the shield, and that he'd take this thing that was fireproof and make a shield out of it. And so that was just dead bloody perfect. It was so cool. And you think, well, how could a kid come up with that? And there's a bunch of answers. I mean, one is, we know snake fear is innate. We know that now. There's been recent research that, 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 that has demonstrated that. Okay, so, and we've been preyed on and been predators for a very long period of time. So the idea that, and I, I found something else interesting about the brain out, that, out about the brain recently too, in a book I was reading by Ray Kurzweil called How to Build a Mind. I think that's what it was called. It was quite a good book. So, I think it was in that book, or it was in a neuroscience paper I was reading. Doesn't matter, but it was in one of those two places. So, you know that scanning technology has got more and more high resolution over the last few years, right? It just gets more and more high resolution all the time. And so people are now able to look at the microstructures of the brain in a way that hasn't been possible before. And so the old idea with the cortex basically was that the cortex was full of a bunch of neurons, and then when one neuron and another fired at the same time, they would wire together. And that's kind of how your brain learned to make connections. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that will do. And then it was found that it wasn't quite that simple because what your cortex is made out of are these columns of neurons that are duplicated, sort of like a, like a centipede's legs. You know, it's, it's very simple genetic code to add another leg, set of legs to a centipede. It's sort of like that with your brain. It's made out of all these columns. And the columns are basically already 
quite wired up. And then as you learn, the columns wire together. Okay, so there's some pre-existent structure there, but there's more pre-existent structure than w that was thought. So it's, it's basically that there are already tracts that link columns together that are in different parts of the brain and the columns can or the columns themselves can send out dendrites to these superhighways which are already there and then the superhighway is there and then it can generate connections to the columns at the end of the superhighway so what that means is that there's a tremendous amount of cortical structure already in place but there's plasticity around that and when i read that i thought well that's part of the source of the archetypes there's already an archetypal structure there that as well as the subcortical structures so you could say that like the kid already had within him not only the capacity to represent not only the monster, but the class of all possible monsters, and the fact that the problem wasn't monsters, the problem was that monsters could continually be generated, which is a way worse problem. And then the answer to that isn't to kill an individual monster, the answer to that is go to the source of the monstrous itself and defeat it. So it's absolutely staggering, and you could imagine that it would take a tremendous amount of meditative effort for people to have come up with that solution over a very long period of time. So, now, the point of the representation is to formulate a picture of what it is that's the threat so that you can then formulate a general all-purpose solution. And his night terrors went away. That was it. And I followed up with his mum because it was really quite remarkable, the whole set of occurrences. You know, and he didn't have night terrors that night even though he'd been having them nightly and that was the end of them. Because he'd solved his problem. Like he needed to be the courageous night that went after the dragon. And so that is what people need to be.